The family I originate really influenced my work. I come from a Jewish family. My grandmother survived Auschwitz and she was the sole survivor in the family. And my grandfather survived Mauthausen. So I was brought up in a family that had all the richness. We had horses, we had tennis courts, we had everything, all the wealth, and then the other day, we lost everything. So I was brought up in a family where a stereotype was killed in the roots. There was no space for stereotypes. And I was taught to live in a democratic, empowering family that really took care of each other. And we really understood what are our wishes and were inspired to follow our dreams. But besides that, my grandmother always said that a Jewish person must contribute to the community. But besides contributing to the community, you need to stay faithful to yourself. So I always ask myself, what do I love to do? And I love to design methods. That's one of my favorite points. So I love to design frames which allow other people to be creative, to experiment, and to do whatever they want. But on the other hand, my biggest impact is in teaching people on how to be better. So what I'm going to present today is two projects that I did with children. So the first one is called Disco School. And I was really wondering and I was really frustrated that when I was researching or when I was going all around the world and examining the, word, the work of my colleagues, it became really dark. We live in a dark era, so everything became critical. We started to criticize one thing after another. And I said, okay, we're anyway frustrated by everything that's going on in the world. And I believe that if we do not dream, if we do not dance, there's no progress. There's no imagination. So I invited my colleagues from Goldsmith University to join me on a project uh, together with children and to remind us what it is and how it is to dance again. So we pointed out the question on the future of cities, like especially the small city that I come from. It's a uh, position near the border with Austria, Italy, Hungary and Croatia, but it died. The industry collapsed and there's almost no one on the street. And I was wondering, like, how would the city look like if the children were in charge? So what we did is, Disco School is a semi-fictional town. And I believe that creating new visions of the city, new desirable futures, can only be done if we combine three different aspects. So one aspect is the inhabitant of the city. The other aspect is the professional or the creatives that can empower them to think differently, to design something that is way better. But we can't do it if we do not have policy makers. Why? Because they have the power to change the policy and they have the power to confirm the change. So we united the vision and we started with the research. And we, oh, I'm not sure it works correctly. Okay, so we designed a methodology in which we said, okay, we need to do a research to understand the city and to understand the wishes of the inhabitants. It was done in the time of COVID and lockdowns. So we said, okay, be ready. Plan is here to be changed. So plan the unplannable and be ready to produce things three times. And we said, okay, in time of lockdowns, in our case, um, just the content was transmitted online 
and it didn't work. So our kids were completely frustrated and they were really devastated. So we said, okay, we want to empower creativity, active citizenship, creative thinking, and give them the power to change the city. So we designed different classes and said, okay, but first we need to introduce the city and we need to give them the most famous architect of the city to inspire them to create graphic design, photography, to create music, songs inspired by the city. And then, because the COVID was going down and the school was released, we could do the studio work with them. So we had a music class, we taught them on how to rap, so we invited uh, famous musicians from the town to teach them on how to produce the music. And later on, we built a participatory exhibition together with them. But the first thing, the research included the interviews, but not only with children, but with historians, with a single mom, etc. But we didn't do it in an ordinary way. Why? When you are designing a location-based systems, you need to think about the location. So if I stick to the one place, I'm just stuck here. I can't move my brain. So what we did, we got a driver and we got all the people into the taxi one by one interviewing them. We had a set of questions asking, where did you fall in love? Like, where did you experience like a lousy experience? What is the, uh, uh, what is the building that you like the most? And different questions that would drive them. And we would drive them around the city so they could be inspired by and reminded by some other um, some environments that could bring a new memory into it. And then in-school creation. In time of COVID, they received an invitation to join the project, international project uh, done by us and the Goldsmith. And 98 children applied to take part in the project. Uh, so what we did with them, we worked with teachers and we said, okay, this is what we want to do and you need to do it with them and you need to do it partly online and when possible uh, in the school. So they did it. And we also collected 26 songs, did an additional in-school research asking them, okay, if you were the mayor, what would you do? And this is a little bit of artwork, so you can see the level that is done by the children. Those children were from fourth to eighth grade. So uh, the oldest was around 12 years old, and the youngest around, I don't know, maybe nine. And this is the level of the art and the photography of the city. They were inspired to search a modernistic, future-oriented, uh, buildings. They created more than 50 blocks of the city, the trees, that allows us later on um, to put it in a map and to redesign the city. On top of that, they were inspired to write songs. So we received more than 26 songs. We took four of them and created them in some kind of a totems of the city. And what we did later on, we published it on a vinyl, so it became kind of a totem of uh, the city. And we asked for the white covers. So the covers could be brought back to them so they could illustrate it. And if you're asking me now, like, where's the technology? I believe that future lies in the technology. And this is why we did the workshop with them in which we gave them, each of the child has another, had another uh, ministry so we had a minister of joy, a minister of technology, a minister of transportation, a minister of finances, and they had to redesign all the systems. So they designed, um, they said, okay, we want a city and we want to really be recognizable because we do not have the identity. And we do not want to have a London eye. We do not want to have a London uh, a tower like in um, Paris. But what we want is a huge toboggan that will go all over the city above and it will drive people from work to work. It will be a new transportation system, completely high tech. In the city, we want to have electric trees. So if you forgot the phone, you can just use it and communicate with whomever you want. And on top of that, we want to have a skate tennis. 
so we can do um, like urban sports whenever we want and how we want it. So together with them, we built a huge exhibition which took place in first in my small town in Murska Sobota. Then afterwards, it was brought to Le Corbusier's site in Fermini in France. And then we had a final exhibition in Ljubljana in our institute and online. So this is just a glimpse of it. So this is Le Corbusier. Uh, this is Ljubljana. It was really playful because they could move the objects uh, and try out how it would be to redesign it. We also had an online talk explaining the methodology. The event was sold out and more than 300 people from all over the world participated in the debate and also made an online exhibition where you can see all the works and the process and the impact. In the time of the COVID, this school gave them hope. And on top of that, they were inspired to, not, to be non-conformists because only non-conformists will change the future of a miserable city and create an environment in which we all want to live in. When we finished the project, we were invited by Vienna Design Week to present the same project there, to present the exhibition. But we also start the cooperation with the Vienna School on redesigning Vienna. But Vienna has one specific. Today we face a lot of the migration. So the topic we are really interested in and we want to know from children is how to live a common future, all of us together, all of the nations, all of the religions, and share the city. On top of that, from the city municipality of Firmini, they called me back and said, Sara, that was so good. We want bigger, we want stronger, and we have five schools to cooperate with. So we have a school in, in Vienna, we have five schools in France, and we have two schools in Slovenia. So from 98 children, we are growing into around 500 children that are going to be educated and creating the future of a city together with us. And we proved that designing together with children, professionals, and policymakers is possible, and even in really, really traditional cities. So this is my team, um, and this is also we made a candy. Uh, I have one with me and I can share it so you can break it. Because what we put in a candy is a Murska Sobota sign. So whoever eats it, it's an old fashioned candy, can be attached to the city. And on top of that, we branded with kids. Uh, so the kids became, um, yeah, the future of the city. At this point, um, I'm not going to show the video because I want to move uh, forward and take a little bit more. Or you want to see the video? Yeah, a little bit. Just a glimpse. OK. Damien is doing faces. So yeah, let's show a video how it uh, looked like. You're right, as always. Uh, view, enter full screen. Um, because it doesn't have a translation, I'll translate, but then also skip some parts. So, sound, please. Good morning, youth of Murska Sobota. My name is Jimmy Lawazo from <laughs> Goldsmiths College, part of the University of London. And I'm just sending this little clip to uh, thank you so much for all the amazing work that you've done uh, at your school. Let's see if I can pronounce it. Uh, uh, at Osnova Sola 3. And I just want to say how much I'm looking forward to uh, working with you over the next couple of months, uh, thinking about your songs and your ideas for Murska Sobota uh, and its future. Um, you are the youth of the town and the foundations of the future. Um, so we're going to have a great time and look forward to seeing you very, very soon. In the meantime, thank you again. Jimmy Loazzo, over and out. So that's my Jimmy from Goldsmith University. Um, so it's in Slovenian, uh, but it's, uh, it speaks on who worked on a project on how we worked with them. Uh, and now we're going to see, we went to the school uh, each time we could 
uh, and we led them to perform. And what was really interesting... When they were, can you lower down the voice a little bit so I can uh, explain what was happening? So when they were writing songs about the city or about the future, there is so much symbolic into it. So one child wrote like, and if you go to this and this place, everybody is not drinking cocktails, but eating them. <laughs> so you could really understand like the emotion uh, of the city and how they felt. Uh, we also taught them on how to perform and how to speak. Um, and then when we finished, um, we had all the research and conversation and what it came out were really essential for the policymaker. So we made some kind of uh, recommendations for the city on what to implement next. Because one of the main findings was that in the city we miss places for urban sports and that we do not have culture which would be uh, sufficient for our kids or the culture uh, that is inspired by the technology. So this is one of the, our, uh, this is the Ministry of Finance. Uh, she was fighting the inequality uh, and she really uh, created a social uh, policy. So she's the Minister of Culture and Fun and they're really explain, explaining what they want to do in a city. Um, so here, uh, when they were creating a new city, they also illustrated so we could understand the form. Uh, so it wasn't about just, they created the whole system. And this was Matt. Um, and if you ask me, so Matt was the leader of uh, the design department uh, at Goldsmiths for years. Um, and if you think the language is an obstacle, it's not. Um, so Matt and Jimmy only speak, spoke English. So I was the one trying to empower them and translate things, but also kids, not only enhancing the creative thinking, uh, they also learned English and started to speak in an English language at the end of the workshop. Uh, at the same time, we also had a team member that was architect, uh, who on the other hand draw uh, what they imagined. So this is, they call, uh, the kids called him Sean, the architect. So they were really amazed on what they did. Uh, and let me see. Yeah, this was our final photo. <laughs> And this is the song created by the kids. So I'm leaving this here. Um, but what was the most essential for the children was to, to really feel it, the final product. So they were amazed by the candies. Uh, they're amazed uh, by the vinyl. And they're amazed that the work that was really done in a stigmatized city that has no presence, that has no identity, went out. And it's today, it was seen by an audience in France. It will gonna be seen by an audience in Vienna and is accessible online so it can be seen by anyone else. Any questions uh, at this point before I move to another project? No? So we keep it uh, for the end. Um, when coming here, this is the project I speak the most, but because it's in the development and in the production since I think 2016, since we started to develop it, um, and it's my favorite one um, because it, it's called Twisted Tales. And what we do with uh, Twisted Tales is that we take familiar fairy tales and we integrate the topic of stigma inside the narrative. Why? To give kids a lesson on love, empathy and understanding and to be able to talk about really, really tough subjects in an unobtrusive and to the children appropriate way. 
So on top of that, and on top of uh, the twist, we really destigmatize. And when we were asking ourselves, but how to deliver such a hard project, we said the only way in which we can deliver it is to design it together with children. So they became the active co-creators during the whole design process, from creation to testing um, to criticizing. And on top of that, we wanted to teach them digital literacy through the stories that matter. So to be able to deliver this project, uh, I invited a colleague of mine, which we call Frog. She's a child behavior specialist to help me deliver a method in which co-creation and destigmatization can happen. So we designed a method of different workshops from illustration to sound creation to animation to testing to again doing voiceover with kids. But all of this was on hand by didactic games. Uh, and it's published online on twistedtales.tv website, so anyone can already use it. And this method of teaching won uh, the Social Marie Prize, which is the oldest prize for innovation in Europe. On top of that, the method is today used in the International School of Kuala Lumpur. And we also gain European funding to completely digitize it. And this is in the process at the moment. Um, so who is it for? It's for children from 6 to 10. It's for parents. It's for families, school, and libraries. And also for organizations that work on the prevention of violence among children. And this is us. And this is my froggy, the blue one. Sometimes she looks like a child, so if, can't, if you can't recognize us, try to search for us. And when designing it, uh, we said, OK, we want to build a universe. But building universe is like, for the capacity of the team, financial aspects, it's really, really huge. So what we said, OK, we're going to design it full scale, but then go step by step and try to achieve one story by story and one book by book and see where it leads us. So we started with webisodes and say, OK, we will have six webisodes and each of them will tackle another topic of stigma. So we have Cinderella, which we call Cinderella. And we have Real Punzel, which is a story about a boy that has an autism. So we twist it and we have Ugly Duckling, which we call Not So Ugly Duckling. Why? Because it's a perfect story to speak about racial abuse, about white and the black. But let me go into the first one. So Cinderella, in our case, is a story about a girl that doesn't have a leg. She walks on crutches. And she has only one wish, to come to the dance, to dance, and not to marry a prince. Why? because she came to dance, and because we wanted to kill a stereotype. I was brought up on a Cinderella, and the message of a Cinderella is that the girl should wait in a castle for a white rich prince, and the white rich prince will save her. Is that so? Is that the real life? I say no. So in our case, she really wants to dance. And how we did it? We did it through the workshops I explained before. So the first session was about the illustration, so we could understand their aesthetics. Uh, and then the second, they created the sound, so they brushed the floor. Um, they imitated the sound of the stepsister, the stepmother, etc. And in the last one, they animated it. But to show you the process on how to co-create with children, so it's always the child is the author, but then the adult comes and supports them in this process. So at first, we try to understand, OK, what are the colors used by them? So this is the color palette that came out. What are the patterns? Like, how they do it? What's the movement and what they want to achieve? So we started to design and taking more and more objects. So we took eye from a one, 
a child's uh, drawing and then the hair from the other. And we tried to create a character that could work in all the mediums that we predefined. Then we implemented the color palette. And at this stage, we came back to the children and tested and said, OK, this is what we designed based on what you told us to design. Does it work? And they laughed. They were dying because they said, OK, come on, stepmother, yeah, she's mean. But who can have such a big ass? No one has such a big ass. And come on, grandmother with a pink hair? No one has a pink, not even one granny has a pink hair. And can you see that crown? That's too huge. So they took a paper, they tore it, and they draw a new crown. And we returned into the office like with a huge headache, and we thought, oh my gosh, what did we went into it? Like we just can't neglect it. It didn't work at the time. So we need to fix it and try to find the balance, what can work and what can't. So we draw and draw and integrated elements and try new aspects, etc. So this shows how all the elements became part of the artwork. And this picture really shows on if we got seven castles out of seven different ones, we created one. Why? To show to a child that singular approach doesn't work, only teamwork does, opposite to the solitary. So they could see how to become empowered by the whole team. Then after we did a pilot, uh, we created an augmented reality book. Uh, so we did an extension. The book is going to be published in four languages in November, prior to the Christmas. So I'm speaking about the first one, about the Cinderil. We did, of course, lots of the testings. Um, and we created magic. We said, OK, first we did uh, a prototype with the gaming elements. And we saw that um, for our audience, it didn't work that well. Uh, so we said, OK, let's just create a magic. That's even enough. So the illustration become live. And at the end of the book, we left uh, blank colors so the children can add their own drawings. And then we said, OK, but if we want to have a sustainability, can we drive it forward? So we, we designed um, additional stories that can work as a TV series. But then we came up with an even better concept. And it's like, this would work better. So the TV series, it's called Fairy Real Squad. And we actually take out the main characters from the six babizodes. So from the princess and the real frog, where the frog always stays the frog, because frog is a frog. We took a frog, and then, all good? Okay. Then we took Cinda, then we took our Rolf with autism, and we put them all in one scene. But how is this participatory? We do a lot of interviews with kids. We ask them, like, what are the challenges that you face? Do you face bullying? How does it go? Do you face color blindness? Can you tell us more? So we take real case scenarios from kids. We turn them into the script, and we turn them into a series that empower. We don't solve problems for them, but we empower them to solve them for themselves. And this is our characters. And then the last extension is an augmented reality exhibition in which we hope to develop a new technology that would allow them to draw in a space that is full of huge, gigantic objects so a child can have more actions to do, either to run around the space, to hide, to jump the objects, to watch parts of the cartoon, or even to add their own drawings. And of course, the educational pro program. Educational program just got around uh, a little bit less than 300,000 euros. And we're at the moment producing uh, four audio books in four languages uh, in four different countries and launching them prior to the Christmas also. But this education program will have an app that will allow you to go. It will be audio driven method that allows you to co-create with the whole family or only a child by its own, and then give us back the our artwork. So this con constant process of a participation with an audience actually never ends. 
Um, this is just a calendar and then the budget. And at the end, just a bit of part of the amazing team that is behind it. Success. Um, we closed down the European funding, Slovenian Film Center funding, Portuguese funding, Croatian funding. We were invited by Kids Regio to take part in Berlinale. Wherever we appeared, we got the award. Um, but I believe the biggest awards are the kids. I usually use this one and say just living is not enough. But today I'll use another one. Because Hans Christian Andersen once said, life is like a melody. Only the lyrics are sometimes messed or fucked up. So um, I don't know if you still do have 15 minutes of attention. Do you want to see the film? Yeah, let's watch the film. So I'm not allowed to show the film, so please don't film it. Because we, have, we didn't have a world premiere yet. Uh, we're going to Japan really soon. Um, we only had the right to do local premieres with kids in Croatia and Slovenia. So this is just a test phase to see if the story is universal enough to work on all the markets. Uh, so enjoy it. Voiceover was done by kids. Uh, we took them from the workshop. Uh, the voiceover in English and French was done in school in Kuala Lumpur as part of uh, their education process. So we go from school to school um, and engage in all levels that in, we can. So, I mean, it's really created uh, by them. Let me enter. Sarah, so you work in the Transmedia Institute of Slovenia and this content that we just saw of Cinderella is it's clearly a transmedia content. So we're going to go through a transmedia concept with the with the audience. It's a story that is expressed through different platforms. And then so the audience participates, creating part of the content. The content expands in different platforms in a short film like this, a series in books and installations as well in different places, right? So tell us how these expansions of transmedia, of this content, is so that we can understand how the ex transmedia expansion works of this story. Of the uh, I understood. Uh, so um, I'll start at the beginning because I had a coaching session today um, and the project that was showcased to me said, this is a transmedia. And then when speaking, we just noticed it's the same content made in uh, three different mediums. So that's not transmedia. In transmedia, we need to have at least two mediums that depends on each other. And we need to have that expansion. Then Damian really explained it well. Um, and in points of uh, the Cinderella or the Twisted Tales, we question a lot if the me because we have a film that is a traditional medium. And then we have the same story in an audiobook in four languages. And then we have the same story adopted to the augmented reality book. Uh, and we have the same story that can be used in an educational program. And we said, OK, do they jeopardize each other? And we really tested it. And we find out that, no, they do not. But they complement each other. Why? Because each child is different. And some children like to watch more the cartoons. The other ones like to read the book. Some really like to listen. Or some need an inspiration to draw, to create. Uh, and in such manner, we left them to decide, like, just choose the medium you want to hear the story and the one you will be able to identify. And from some t time to time, you will for sure jump into another medium to experience it in a different way. OK. OK, so this content is co-created with the children. The story was written by children. The drawings are based on children's drawings, right? So uh, how we did it, we had an initial script uh, that was done by a professional script writer. But then in the sessions, in the workshops, we also tested the narration and the understanding and also, through when we filmed the voiceovers, we tested the dialogues. And the dialogues didn't work, so they killed them. It meant that at the end, we would always go a step back 
And instead of, I don't know, an example, um, I have two legs, if they would say this doesn't work, or I can't say it like this, we would say, okay, it doesn't work. How would you say it? So in each step of the process, we integrated their own narrative. So they said what needs to be said. And maybe sometimes, if I look at it as a director of the film, sometimes I'm like, oh, but that conversation doesn't work like in all the other films. But of course it doesn't, because it was, uh, it was actually adopted by children. And it's the way the child would do it, and not an adult for a children. And so this series has different versions. No, sorry, the, the, the series has uh, stigma. And there's this uh, kid that uh, lacks a leg, and there's other stigmas. So, so how do you treat it? What are these stigmas that you work So the methodology is always the same. The methodology is designed, it is tested, it is also used in other schools, and it works. So we use the same method in different environments. So an example, at the moment we are working on Real Ralph, which is a story about the, um, the boy with an autism, and this is done in Romania by the children in Romania. Why? Because each of the stories is done in another environment. An example, Princess and the Real Frog. This is a story about the princess and the frog that always stays the frog, and princess has to justify why she loves the frog that is uh, quirky, um, that it's uh, droller, um, that it's so much smaller than her and always stays the frog, and it's done together with children in Croatia. Why? Because we need, want to understand uh, expressions of different children and work in different environments and see where that brings us. Good, so we're going to open up the mic for questions. Does anyone have a question for Sarah? Any question? Uh, maybe just to finish, because we did a lot of testings and the last time I showed it in a school, one of the kids said, this is like the best cartoon I've ever seen in life. And I said, come on, on top of all the Disney cartoons, on top of everything what you have, how is this the best film that you saw? And she said, because this film has a heart. And I believe the hearts of many children have been integrated uh, in this project. Uh, and it's not us making it. It's done. So thank you. Gracias, Sara. Muchísimas Muchas gracias. gracias. Un aplauso para Sara. Para...